Thank you. Here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. So I just want to go over how you all got started into genealogy and what inspired you in the first place. Like, what's your story? All right. So I, I did have to go ask my mom to see how, early, how old I was when I started getting interested because I thought it was a little bit later than it actually was. Um, she said, before eight years old, I was always interested in family stories and family pictures and all the different memories, things that you, that you find with stuff. Um, but I then had a duty to God assignment or, and a Cub Scout assignment that I did. A, I had to fill out a pedigree chart. And from there, it just kind of blossomed. And there was a point where she couldn't, she wanted I always wanted to go to the stake family history library, mm -hmm. but it was a little bit far away. So I wasn't able to go very often, but she, we, uh, we had to get me there as often as I could, but it wasn't as often as I would have liked. Wow. That is so awesome. Eight years old. That's super young. And so then after your, after that initial experience doing your pedigree chart at the stake building and the family history center, what, what led you next? You served a mission, right? I did serve a mission. I served in the Spain Barcelona mission um, from 2006 to 2008. Uh, wow! But before that, you know, I when we came up to Utah to visit family, we would stop at Deseret Book, and so I would go and always check out their family history materials. I then would um, I, I actually bought an old program called Path. It, it's a family. It's precursor to Family Search, Family Tree, and I, I'm a little embarrassed to say as a genealogist, I thought genealogy was going online, accessing a, a, a database and just typing names into the, ped, into the um, program. Uh, I later learned in, at BYU when I started my family history degree that I was wrong, but luckily I, the problem was that growing up in a small town in Northern Arizona, you don't get the opportunity to always know how to you don't have anyone there to really teach you how to do family history, so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's so unique about today is now it's like easier than ever before to learn how to get started and how to get going with everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. So what's so cool is that you were born at the beginning of when this all has become like digitalized and you've been able to see it progress. Has that been interesting for you? Yeah, it has. I mean, so when I first started doing family history, most everything was still on um, on microfilm. Anything the church had, it was on microfilm. So I I tried accessing a few microfilms, but our little stake center, it didn't have a lot of access. Our, the, the Family History Center didn't have a lot of films. So I didn't really use them much. Uh, but as I started growing more interested, the internet was becoming more prominent. Family Search had started to... It, program had come out by the time I got PATH, uh, the first iteration of Family Search had. And so I started using Family Search, the databases on FamilySearch.org. Um, and I've seen it progress to the state it is now from the, those very initial stages it, in the technological sense. There's a lot beforehand that I did not experience. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. And it's progressed so rapidly. Now, now we're using like artificial intelligence to be able to help index, right? Um, I believe they, there are companies and things trying to get that started. Part of the problem is um, the optical handwriting recognition is kind of tough because every person's handwriting will differ. And even a single individual can change their style of handwriting dependent upon how much they're, <laughs> how fast they have to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true with like those sentences. They're they're writing so much in one day. It's crazy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So you help index and you help with so many different languages, right? Yeah. So I, I'm a research specialist at the Family History Library, and uh, I'm on the Latin America research team. And on that team, I end up having to help read seven different languages what seven yes so i have to read records that are in english latin catalan spanish italian uh, french and i missed one portuguese 
Wow. <laughs> That's when you know you know a lot of languages, when you like start to lose count of how many you have. That's impressive. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> So how did you learn all these different languages? I know you learned a little bit in your mission, right? Yeah, so I, I learned Spanish um, on my mission. And then when I was going to BYU, I actually did not attend a young single adult ward. I opted into going to a Spanish speaking ward there in Provo. Um, and what happened was, so I spoke Spanish all the time with people from the ward. I was texting in Spanish, doing a lot that way. And then when I started the family history program, I had the, the person who introduced me to the program was like, I can get you back to Spain. And I said, I'm signing up for the Spanish, even though I have zero Spanish ancestry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was able to go do two intern research internships back to Spain and in Europe. And I've done research in uh, France, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Wow. That is impressive. So, wow. I've done two research internships there. I've done other trips to Europe for that. I've done trips to a couple Latin American countries, uh, Chile, Colombia, Brazil. Um, I've hit archives in all those, Dominican Republic. And just, I, I fell in love with the records. I fell in love with the with the way people kept the records and the, the value and treasure that they are in them uh, to the point where I basically prefer the, the that ancestry than most of even the United States because the records are just so much more rich. Man, wow, that is so crazy. So you so you got you started in Cub Scout and now you're at this point where you've gone to all these different countries and you've seen all these archives. That is <laughs> insane. What is like your recommendation for somebody that maybe has dabbled a little bit in family search? How would you get them started? What was like your advice? Um, so one of the things that happens a lot, especially with members of the church and even people just getting started with family history, they want to do it all on all at first. They just want to tackle all of it all at once. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to try and tackle it all at once. The easiest thing to do is to find something that you're interested in. Uh, there's many aspects to family history that a lot of people don't realize. It's more than just searching for names, dates, and places. It incorporates the telling of your own story, the stories of your ancestors. It includes studying their lives, their history. Um, it includes going out and just making fam memorable family events and recording them. Um, you know, and just getting started in the things that interest you. When it comes to dealing with your family tree, I always tell people, where do you feel like you need to research? Where do you feel like you need to look? Because usually if they have a feeling, there's somebody on that line that needs their help. Whether it's fixing a mistake that happened or whether it's taking their name to the, to the temple. Um, all of it is part of family history. And the the spirit does help you know where you need to go and you will feel where you need to go on that. And when you get started on it, focus on one individual family in the research part. If you try to tackle it all, you'll get overwhelmed. But the one individual family work on a parent, father, mother, and children, and then move on to the next family. I love that. I love that. Um, there's a lot of great info in that. And I've, I've heard from various like, psychologist if you just tackle one little thing and you complete that one thing it's a lot easier to get done with the bigger more humongous thing rather than looking at it from this bird's eye view focus on one thing get that done focus on one thing get that done i love that absolutely well, we got this question um what do you do on the research trips so on the research trips um uh, the first two i was a student so i tackled the assignments and tasks that were given to me on the other one, I was going more for pure interest sake. I, there were some record types and some records I wanted to dig into. I knew they existed, but I didn't have much experience. So I was going to get more experience and learn that way. Um, I know people who go to Europe to, on research trips that they get clients and they are researching those clients' families in the archives in Europe. Uh, there are many records. Uh, one common misconception is I typed my name into fa into family search and it didn't come up. 
That means it doesn't exist. So, <laughs> it's a very common misconception. Um, when, when you're researching online, the amount of records that are available digitally is very limited. The amount of records that are available on microfilm are still limited. And the number of records that have been indexed by, by people that you can type, search their name, is even more limited. It is <laughs> such a small percentage that it's ridiculous. I mean, we're getting more, but it's so, so small. And so you still sometimes have to go to um, Europe to go and trace those researches get or those records you have to get into the archives you have to dig into the old records i've held records in my hand that have been 1400 or that are 400 years old because well we needed to look at them you know so. <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's crazy man you're, you're <laughs> you've done so much there's this other question that we got do you have a favorite ancestral story um there's quite, I, I have quite a few. I have a rich pioneer heritage. Uh, one of my favorites, however, is um, uh, of my eight grandparents. All of them are members of the church and are descended from pioneers. One great grandmother is not. She is from Southern Missouri uh, and she liked to rile people up. And so one of my favorite stories is always about her um, and how she would tell people in our little community that was settled by the members of the church that her her ancestors were part of the mobs in Missouri. And I've gone, I've since gone through and disproved it, not for the interest of trying to disprove it, but because great grandma lied so she could make people angry. And <laughs> it just <made> me laugh. <laughs> Oh man, I love how you have this skill set where you're like you're like a detective in some way. Do you ever feel like that? You feel like you're part of like the CIA almost? <laughs> CIA, no. Um, <laughs> a detective, absolutely. Uh, many genealogists will can will will agree that you know doing genealogy work is detective work. You're going through basically you have a, you you bought a puzzle at your secondhand store. And you can't even, like, you try to put it together, but not all the pieces are there. So you have to put the pieces as close together as you can. Oh, and you also don't have the picture on the front of the box. So <laughs> <laughs> just have to kind of start piecing all the pieces together. And it's a lot of detective work, digging into the records and reading them and trying to capture all the subtle nuances that you might not expect are in there. What a great analogy. I love that. That is amazing. Oh, man. That's awesome. So I remember earlier you were talking about family history, not only talking about looking back, but also recording what you know. What is your experience with that? Do you have like a journal or have you ever gone to your grandparents and recorded their stories or what? I've kind of done all the above. Um, I'm not <laughs> the world's best journal writer, I will admit. I have tried and I have multiple journals that are on and off. Um, but journaling is one of the best things you can do because it's family history is also your story. You know, story is part of it. Um, and you are going to have posterity and they are going to want to know what happened to you. Uh, there's a lot of different projects and things out there, especially during this time that we're all at home. There's projects that are designated to recording your story and recording the history of the moment but you know my experience with it is it's phenomenal one of the favorite things that i've seen recently at the family history library we have some recording booths where people can go in and do video recordings and one of the my the favorite things i saw was um, a grandma had brought their grandkids in and had them answer these interview questions very basic ones i was three four years old and the um <laughs> and the grandparents they're like i'm going to bring them in each year and get this whole perspective of their story of their life at that one time i love that so much that's so cool so i and that's part of this is you know I, and i try and tell people it's more than just the names and dates so a lot of people struggle with that i love that looking at the story behind it oh man <laughs> 
We got this other question. What is a typical day like at your job? So typical day at my job, um, I wake up and go into work first off. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, we shared that in common. Look at that. <laughs> we, we, and I'll go with the, um, we're not during quarantine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but typically in my job, it will vary a little bit, but I will go, I will work on assignments from work. Some of my assignments include creating uh, family history training for missionaries or creating tasks for, um, or not creating ta tasks, classes uh, to teach at conferences or teach as webinars at the Family History Library. And um, then I also will spend quite a bit of time on the research floor uh, where I help guests and interact with guests and missionaries and volunteers and help them with their research questions. Wow. So how often are you doing these calls with various people? Um, so on the floor, I, at least that's what we call it, uh, being on the research floor, we, you know, we're open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we're basically there all day long to help with get help with questions. And we, of course, rotate shifts, but yeah. Man. So how many people, like, this is just like a fun little question. How many people do you think you talk to, like, on the phone? On the phone? Not too many. We don't do much cons consultations on the phone. It's mostly just in-person consultations. Oh. Um, but the in-person, I mean, thousands, you know. <laughs> I, I, we have some people that come in and... They're, they have their special consultant that they won't work with anyone but that consultant. <laughs> <laughs> that, that research specialist. I, so it's like, okay, I have my fans. My other coworkers have their fans. It's kind of entertaining to see that we all have our own little fan club. You know? <laughs> oh, man, that is amazing. You got your own little uh, posse over here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Ooh, we got another question. Tell us about your favorite experience with a guest at the library. How did that go? Uh, that one's a tough one to pick. There's so many good ones. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the sad things and interesting things about the library is if you are, um, if you help, if, if someone cries while you're helping them, you know you did a good job. And it's not <laughs> the cry like, leave them falling because they didn't find anything it's more of the 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 emotional cry you know the spiritual cry that they get because they've been touched by the spirit um i had one lady come in once and she was wanting she felt that she needed to do the work for a particular ancestor and she was just so adamant about trying to get this get the work done and she had a list of names, many of whom did not qualify for temple work at that time because they just hadn't gone through the, they hadn't waited the correct process time and she didn't have the permission. But the one person she had felt that she really needed to get done had just, had just been able to be approved because of the way the policy works. And that was the one she did. And it was very touching to see the spirit, not just working with me, but also with her to realize, look, we do need to follow the policies, but the spirit will guide us when it is, when it is time to those individuals who have been waiting and who are now ready for it. Wow. I love how the stars align and how, you know, the, the curious workmanship, the, the, the ways are so unique and it all connects. Oh, you have no idea how often it happens, too. One of the things that happens all the time that me and my colleagues cannot figure out or describe how it works is we'll be helping a guest and we're showing them the basics of how to search, how to use the system. And we say, look, so you just to use the navigator, you can click right, you can click left, you can jump to some random number. So we do it and it happens to be the page that they have a family member on. <laughs> so there's spirit behind it but sometimes it's like i and i have to tell them look i don't do this all the time but it does just happen sometimes and you're one of the ones that it just happens for so <laughs> wow that is amazing the odds like of that happening oh especially when you're picking a random number 
between <laughs> one and three thousand. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. That is incredible. Man, well, Brandon, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to answer some questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about family history? Any tips? Just that it's extremely rewarding. I mean, there's the spiritual benefits that go along with doing family history, not just um, the ones that we see because with the you know, the, they're getting their temple work done, they're becoming saved. There's a change that happens in you as an individual when you do to family history work. Um, and it goes along with doing the temple work because they go together as one. Uh, doing just the research, doing just the temple, it's only half of the work. So when you do both together, there's a real change that happens in individuals and in a person. It's really quite amazing to watch a person change when they come through, um, as they go through the process. We've, you know, some, we have people who come all the time to the library and we get to watch them from the very beginning to as they get a lot more experience. And there is a change that happens. And it's the, the only way to explain it is the spirit is changing their hearts. Wow, thank you so much. What a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Brandon, you are the best. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Jared. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye. <laughs>